talking about being presence driven. And so I, I was kind of processing that out with the Lord and asking him, what do you want me to talk about with this frame? And I, and I thought about, you know, uh, Ryan's message a few weeks ago when he talked about, you know, getting in the secret place. And I was like, that's, that's, I love that. That's, that's my jam. That's where I live. I love the secret place. So let's start there. Let's start in the secret place. We got that. We are processing it, things out with the Lord. Okay, good, good, good. All right. So here's what he told me. This is what he wants me to share with you guys this morning. And then we'll dive into a passage that I think will be really helpful in illustrating this. And then we'll do some stuff at the end. So this is what he says. Sit with me until you see me. Behold me until you know me. Stay with me until you burn for me. These are the three things that I, that I really felt strongly about this week. And, and he, here's what he told me. He's like, Jesus wants to interrupt us this morning. He wants to interrupt those moments. Some of us are living in moments of disappointment, of despair, of doubt. He wants to interrupt our pursuit of self-soothing and self-healing he wants to interrupt our desire to isolate and withdraw and run away. He wants to interrupt our attempts at human reasoning, thinking, well, this is why this happened, and this is what I can do next, and I'm planning, and I'm preparing, and, I'm, and there's nothing wrong with being a planner and a preparer. That's, that's who I am, but human reasoning can take you so far, and then it abandons you. So he wants to interrupt our human reasoning, and he wants to interrupt us on our journey to nowhere. Some of us are walking and we're walking and we're walking and we're just through the shock and the disappointment and the moments that we're living in, we're just walking. And Jesus wants to interrupt us this morning. I don't know if that speaks to you at all right now, but hopefully by the end of this message, there's a few of you, maybe more, who will be impacted by what I believe the Lord sent me here to say. Stay, sit with him until you see him. Behold him until you know him. Stay with him until you burn for him. I'm gonna read a passage for you out of Luke 24. This is a pretty popular passage. You've probably heard this one before. Uh, Luke 24, this is right after the crucifixion and the resurrection, but it's in between the ascension and it's in between the moments where Jesus is fully revealing himself to all the disciples. He's kind of going in a process, right? He meets Mary at the tomb you know, then, you know, later on, he, he steps into the upper room and he's, he's talking with the disciples and, and then he sees them in the field and he goes up and everything like that. He sees them on the beach and all this kind of stuff. But this is in between that time. So some people have reported that Jesus has been risen, but others have not seen him. So I want you to think about that in context. These disciples that have followed Jesus have been putting all of their faith all of their hope, all of their trust in this man, and then they watched this man get hung on a cross and die before their very eyes. A very bloody, embarrassing, gruesome death. And then someone had the nerve to tell him that he's risen, and they go and look, and they didn't find him. So, there's two disciples that are walking along the road, and I'll read this for you. I'll pick up in Luke chapter 24 and verse 13. Now behold, two of them, meaning disciples, were traveling the same day. This is Easter Sunday. This is Resurrection Day. To a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have, uh, you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Some of you, your translations say, as you're standing there, sad, as you're standing there, disappointed. Then one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem and have you not known these things which happened there in these days? And he said to them, what things? So they said to him, things concerning Jesus of Nazareth who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, 
Today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and a certain woman of our company who arrived at the tomb earlier astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women said, but they did not, but him they did not see. Then he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart, believe in all, uh, slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ have suffered these things to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses, in all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. I'm going to stop there and I'll pick up there here in a minute. But wow, that's a pretty intense story. Here's these two disciples, one of them saying Cleopas. We don't really know who he is. He's just a guy. That's the only mention of him. And then there's another one who wasn't named, perhaps his wife, perhaps a companion, perhaps another friend. And they're walking on this road on Easter Sunday, having experienced all the things of that past weekend. And Jesus comes to them. He says, what are you talking about? And why are you so sad? Let's pray for a minute. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for your guidance, your hand in our life. Thank you for your constant voice. And even now, Holy Spirit, I pray that you will speak through me the words you want me to speak. And that every ear would hear the words that you want them to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. This passage is pretty interesting, and I love it. Uh, it's been on my heart for the past couple of, of months, actually. I've been thinking about it and, and processing it and praying into it. And just, you know, it's one of those things that, that you just, you, it sticks out to you. And you go, oh, okay, well, this is interesting. And the Lord just has me in this passage. And so whenever a pastor called me to preach, this is what the Lord dropped in my heart to preach on. And so I thought, okay, well, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that with this passage. I'm going to show this, and I'm going to show that. And I had this whole thing mapped out and planned out, and the Lord was like, let's just, let's just do this. Let me just share with you a few thoughts. So I said, okay, let's just do that. <laughs> and so this morning, I just want to take you through this passage again, and I want to show you just a handful of things. Because like I said at the beginning, I believe that Jesus wants to interrupt us. He wants to interrupt us in the moments of our disappointment, of our despair, of our doubt. He wants to interrupt us on our journey to nowhere. He wants to interrupt us and reveal himself to us. What does this have to do with being presence-driven? Well, I'm glad you asked. I'll show you that here in a little bit. All right, so I want you to know this, that here in a few minutes, I'm gonna share with you the rest of the passage. And uh, ultimately, what I want you to share with you is that in the midst of these disciples' despair and disappointment in this moment, the Lord directed them and the Lord established a place for them to commune with him. And I'll show you that here in a minute. Just know that in the midst of our brokenness, there's a table of communion with him that reignites our hearts and passion for him. So I want you to think about when I say the word communion, I'm not necessarily talking about the sacrament of communion where we take the the, uh, the grape juice, right? And we take the cracker. I'm talking about communing with the Lord. And that word kind of means a couple different things, but specifically it means a shared experience with. Having a shared experience with the Lord. Being aware that you were walking into something or you were experiencing something with the Lord. He's experiencing it with you. He's right there beside you. So that's what I mean when I talk about communion or communing with the Lord. There's another term that I'm going to use pretty regularly called beholding him. So basically what that is, just, for, just so you know, I'm talking about not just admiring him. Look, it's good to admire the Lord. I love admiring the Lord. When I admire the Lord, I'm like, wow, he's so good. I can just look at him from afar and go, look at what he did. You can admire people from afar, but if you really want to behold someone, you got to step a little closer and you got to get into their face and you got to look them in the eye. That's what I mean by beholding, where you're close and moving closer to where you can see him and he can see you and he becomes your affection. He becomes the object of your attention. I'll get to that here in a minute. I do want to just point your attention to this first couple of verses in this passage because I love the way that the Bible sets this up. The Bible is a really good book, guys. Have you known this, noticed that? It's not just a good book in the sense of that it gives us breath and life because the scriptures are 
God breathed, but it's also a good book in a literary sense in that it just tells a story so beautifully. It's like God weaving this story throughout scripture, and I love it so. In the beginning of this passage, we see, now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem, and they talked together of all these things that had happened. Remember, crucifixion, resurrection, scattered reports of him being risen, but really not too many people have seen and they can't really confirm. So they're walking along this road away from Jerusalem, away from the place that happened, away from the place of their disappointment. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself draw new draw near and went with them. Look, they were conversing, they were reasoning this word kind of means the mixture of different things from disputing with one another to analyzing facts to having this deep intense conversation. It's a word where they're really trying to come to terms with what happened and they're reasoning together about what they just experienced, what they have experienced over the past months or years that they followed him and what it means for them now. They're sitting, having this conversation. They're walking along this road to Emmaus, and up comes Jesus, and they did not know him. Their eyes were restrained. Now, this is really important to think about. A lot of us read this passage, and we immediately think that God hid or closed their eyes and hid Jesus from them in the sense that they couldn't couldn't recognize them. And that's one possibility. Other scholars believe that perhaps in their grief and in their disappointment and in their despair, they would not allow themselves to believe that they were sitting and talking and, and walking with him. Could be both. The Lord hid his identity from him, them, but then also in their grief and their despair and their doubt, they wouldn't believe it was him. So it's very important to think about. Verse 17, and he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another that you walk and are sad? And that word conversation, again, that's that word that means debating, arguing, they're talking, perhaps it's getting heated, and that word sad, I love this word because this is the same word that Jesus mentions earlier in Matthew when he says how the hypocrites would pray and they would distort their face to look sad and gloomy and depressed as they pray as if they're afflicted. So visibly, visibly, he notices something about them. They're sad, they're downcast, they're disappointed, something's up. They couldn't, they couldn't put on their face a happy face. They had a sad face, all right? And I love this about this passage that it was so detailed. Luke, Luke gets so detailed in his version of this. Mark just said there were two walking in the country and then Jesus appeared to them so they ran back to the, to, to the disciples. That's what Mark said. And like two, you know, Mark's pretty brief and straight to the point. But Luke just takes his time with this story. And we know that these are two disciples. These are largely unknown disciples. This wasn't the core group, right? This wasn't the main crew. These weren't the guys on the stage with the microphones. These weren't the guys who were in charge. This was Cleopas and some other person. I don't even know who Cleopas is. It's the first time we meet him, the last time we meet him. So this is unknown, two unknown disciples, not the core group. Jesus walks up to them. They didn't recognize him. They're sad, they're downcast, they're disappointed. They're just carrying with them the events of these past few days. And it's very obvious. And they're sitting there and they're reasoning, they're talking with each other. I just wanna paint this picture for you. They're on this road, perhaps they're arguing, perhaps they're disappointed, perhaps they're weeping, perhaps they're just overcome with this moment. And they're walking to Emmaus. What does Emmaus mean? Where is Emmaus? There's so many... uh, potential places that this could have been that actually no one really quite knows where Emmaus was. The word even just means hot springs, a spring for healing. They were walking away from Jerusalem, this place of despair, this place of disappointment, this place of defeat, reasoning together, trying to make sense of all of it, arguing with each other, weeping, crying, overcome with emotion, and they're just stumbling towards somewhere where they could find something that might ease their pain. And then Jesus walks up to them. And they have no clue it's him, perhaps overcome with grief and they can't see, or perhaps he withheld his identity or a little bit of both. 
And he begins to talk to them and ask them. And I love this next part because it just shows the humanity of people. Read this with me. In verse, I believe it's 18, it says, uh, and then one whose name was Cleopas, the one that we actually know the name of, he spoke first. And he says, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which have happened in these days? Can you just feel the... <clears throat> Are you serious right now, dude? <laughs> like, where have you been? Are you, you're the only guy who doesn't know about this? There's crowds in the street yelling. There's Roman soldiers. There's all this spectacle. There's people wailing. Even a few days ago, we had a party. Like, we had a, at least you were there. Were you there for that? Did you, did you see that? We, he rode in on a donkey, and then he rode out. He rode out in a funeral cart. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I, maybe I'm the only stranger here who doesn't know that, right? So he says, what things? The, thing, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people, how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned and de to death and crucified him. This part gets me, because I get it. I've done this before. But we were hoping, we were hoping that it was he who's going to redeem Israel. I want you to think about that for a minute. You ever been there? Seriously, listen to this phrasing. He goes, but we were hoping. Were, past tense, no longer hoping. We, collectively, we all bought into this. We hoped that he would what? Redeem Israel. The plan. Remember the plan? This was the plan. Look, we heard about it. We prayed about it. We prophesied about it. This was the plan. We bought in, and we hoped. Besides all that, it's been three days, is what he says. It's been three days. Remember, remember that phrasing from Lazarus' tomb? Lord, it's been four days. The body's starting to stink. Represents that finality. After the third day, that's it. The Jews believed, you've heard this before, that the soul would leave and depart the body after about three days. And it's that third day. It's final. And on top of that, these two women <laughs> were down at the tomb, saw it empty, claimed they saw a vision. Jesus was alive. But we all checked it out. We didn't find him. So how about this? You had your hopes crushed. And then you got some good news. And then you run to that place of good news only to find, it's like they said, but he's not here. We didn't find him. So they started walking. Where did they go? Emmaus. Where's that? I don't know. They just started walking. So he comes to them, talks with them. They begin to share the story. They begin to share their heart we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all these things, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came to us saying they had had a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Can you hear the disappointment? Can you hear the pain and the doubt in this man's voice. Jesus was just asking, hey look, tell me about these things that have happened. This man could have taken a lot of time and talked about the cross, the trial that was messed up, his walk with the Lord, all these things, but he focused on what was really, really, really bothering him. The moment hurt, I got my hopes up again, only to have them crushed. One more time. So me and my friend, we're out. And we start walking. So here we are, talking to some stranger on the side of the road, headed towards nowhere. Hoping to just ease the pain. <laughs> Jesus, I love, I love Jesus. Do you know what Jesus' response to this was? Because, you know, most of us would be like, oh my gosh. 
I didn't know. I'm so sorry. Like that, right, you know, our first response, right? I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry that happened to you. I'm so sorry you're dealing with that. I'm so, that would be my response. That would be your response, likely. This is what Jesus says. Oh, foolish ones. <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> these, give these guys a break. Oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe. In all that the prophets have spoken, ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and enter into his glory. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. He meets them on the road. They tell him this stuff. They open their soul to him. He rebukes them, and then he begins to walk with them and share with them, starting with Moses and the scriptures that pertain to him. That's a lot of scriptures. That's a lot of chapters. <laughs> That's a lot of passages. That's a lot of books. And he expounds on it. And he gives them all the answers. Except for one. They still don't know who he is or where Jesus is. He withholds that one from them. But he gives them all the answers. He didn't lead with the answer they were looking for. You notice that? He didn't lead with that answer. Because really what they were, they were wanting was some answer as to where is he? Why is there a conflicting report? There's these women who've seen him. There's this that probably should have happened this way. And then there, he's not here. We're missing him. Okay, that's good, Jesus, that you explained this whole process. And it's good that he ought to have suffered these things. But he, we're still missing him, right? He didn't lead with that. I, I probably would have led with that. Guys, don't, don't, worry, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. He's here. This is him. Isn't that awesome? Cool. Oh, awesome. But you know what? That, <laughs> we want that because then that kind of solves the problem for us, right? But Jesus walked with them in the place of their disappointment. It reminds me again of Lazarus. He could have stopped, Mary, 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 calm down. I got this. He could have stopped Mary and said, look, 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 I'll just call him right now. Come on, Lazarus, come forth. But Jesus actually went through the process with her, and Jesus actually wept with her, knowing what he was about to do. Jesus went through the process with these guys, and he expounded to them, and he walked with them, and he expounded with them, and then he talked with them, and then he showed them, and he was very, very patient with them, so much so that a minute, and a minute from now, I'm going to tell you that the day had been spent. He spent the day with them. These two disciples, who we don't even know who they are, who left Jerusalem and the rest of their crew and went on a road looking for something that would ease the pain on the road to nowhere. Jesus spent the day with them. And he shared with them, perhaps more than he shared with anybody else, about these scriptures pertaining to his death. Because up until that point, he told the disciples, but they still didn't get it. He would give them bits and pieces as they could handle it, but they still didn't quite get it. But it says that he shared with them, beginning with Moses, and expounded to them all, all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. He revealed openly to them what he had only shared in bits and pieces before. And he journeyed with them. <laughs> and I love this passage uh, that he opens with, you foolish ones, who are slow to believe. This word slow to believe actually means having a dull heart. They were dull in heart. Well, of course they were. They had just been through an intense weekend. Riding the high of a week before when they're running into Jerusalem and all this, you know, here's the palms and here's Hosanna and oh my gosh, this is it. This is the moment, y'all. Like this is it. You have a friend like that who's just like, this is it. They're hype all the time. I'm not the hype person, but pretend I am for a minute. Like, that's the thing that they were excited about. They were so pumped. And then, like, one thing after another, after another, after it. Oh, my gosh, what is happening? Someone, time out. Jesus is dead on the cross. How did we go 
So they experience this whole week, the weekend, they're just, they're carrying it with them. They're walking down this road, disappointment, despair, grief, shame, brokenness, guilt from even walking away, guilt from probably not believing, guilt from this man that they met. They did, he's talking about all this stuff. They're just processing this all out with the Lord, walking down the road, headed to nowhere, hoping to just find something that might ease the pain. And he says, you're dull of heart. You're slow to believe. You're dull of heart. And he doesn't lead with the answer, but he brings them through this process. But I love this. When Jesus begins to talk, that sort of ends the dialogue. Get what I'm saying? Cleopas was really, really, really kind of forthcoming with all the things that had happened. But by the time Jesus started talking, his mouth closed. They begin to listen. Jesus was the one who was talking. Jesus was the one who was giving them instruction. Jesus was the one who was communicating, and they listened. The next passage, verse 28, it says this. Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone further. He's that patient with them. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. So he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass as he sat at the table with them that he took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them. Stop here for a second. The day was far spent. He had taken the entire rest of the day and spent it with these two. Let me just remind you of who these two were. I have no idea who these two were. They're not Peter and James. They're not Mary and the other Mary. They're not Martha and Lazarus, and they're not anyone who would have anything good to say that we would remember. They're Cleopas and some other guy. Maybe the guys who sat on the back row during the Sermon of the Mount. What did he say? I don't know. Blessed are, I have no idea. We'll find out later. Maybe these are the guys who, (laughs) they were on the shoreline whenever he was on the boat with Peter, James, and John and doing all these incredible things, and they got the secondhand information In fact, it doesn't even appear that they were the ones who actually went to the tomb, but somebody else had gone for them. They were living a secondhand experience. They were not on the front seat. They were in the back row. They were someone we wouldn't know. So these are two unknown, perhaps second class, how we would define them in church world, right? Not gonna say that, but some of us feel that way, right? We feel like we're second class. We sit on the back row. We slip in. We slip out. We're the unknown. We're not the ones who get the dreams. We're not the ones who get the visions. We're not the ones who see the miracles. We're not the ones who get to testify. We're not. It's Cleopas and some other guy. The unknown disciples. But Jesus appeared to those two. Mark, I love Mark's passage. Jesus appeared to two people in the country, (laughs) and they ran back to Jerusalem to testify. Luke goes, let's talk about this for a minute. These unknown men, Jesus spent this day with them. They walked seven miles together. It's a couple of hours if you're walking and then talking. And then they stayed and they spent even more time because it said, and it came to pass, meaning they spent more time sitting and eating. Remember, this is the Eastern culture in the old ancient world that if you were to make a meal, you actually had to make the meal. It wasn't microwave the meal. It wasn't DoorDash the meal. It wasn't, let me get this meal out of the fridge and put it in the oven. This was, we have to make a fire. We have to bake the bread. We have to get together. We have to, it's going to take some time. And Jesus stayed with them and broke bread with them, meaning that he was there with them as they shared a meal, a shared experience as he had communion with them. Cleopas and the other guy two unknown disciples who had just walked away from the group headed on their way to Emmaus 
to nowhere and Jesus interrupted them. And he walked with them and he abided with them and he communed with them. And in that moment, I want you to see a few things. See, he indicated that he would have kept walking with them. Perhaps he was sort of hinting at he had somewhere else to be. <laughs> but they constrained him, this stranger, right? Remember, keep in mind, he's a stranger to them. They don't know him. They don't know who he is. Now, their culture's a little bit more hospitable than ours. Maybe not the South. We're pretty hospitable. But they, they really, really didn't know him, but yet they felt compelled to constrain him and say, would you come in and abide with us? Perhaps this was their home. Perhaps this was an arrangement they had made to go live somewhere. Perhaps the next morning they were going to go wake up and go back to their life as normal. Perhaps they were from Emmaus. There's all kinds of theories on why were these guys going in this direction and what were they doing? And they constrained him. They said, would you stay with us? They felt compelled to stay in proximity to him. In the midst of their hurt, in the midst of their disappointment, in the midst of their despair, in the midst of their doubt, they said, would you just stay with us? Have you been there before? In the midst of your hurt, in the midst of your doubt, in the midst of your despair, in the midst of your disappointment, walking away from all your problems, looking for something that might ease your pain, and you say, would you just, would you just stay with us? Would you abide with us? Would you stay in proximity? They were compelled to stay in proximity with him. And they said, abide with us. And remember, they didn't have the revelation yet of who he was, but something compelled them to say, abide, stay, don't go, stay here. And Jesus sat with them for however long it took to create that meal, and he took charge. Perhaps he was the only one talking at that point. And he blessed the bread, he broke it, and he gave it to them. And when this happened, you probably know the story, but I'm going to tell you. Verse 31, then their eyes were opened, and they knew him. Jesus walked with them the whole day. He expounded on every scripture, giving them all the reasons why this happened. They were reasoning together. They had every thought and theory and conspiracy and all this kind of stuff to think about. Why did this happen? What could have happened differently? What, what, what does this mean now going forward? And he goes, let me just take you through all the answers, knowing that this really doesn't even scratch the surface of what really is bothering you because you still don't have me. But he gave them all of those answers to all their reasoning except for one. And he saved that for the moment of communion where the bread of life took the bread and broke it to them and gave it to them. And they knew him. In that moment of communion, in that moment of intimacy, listen, they're off the road. They're in this private place. They had already felt this. They have to stay in proximity with him. They've already felt this. We need to abide with this guy. I don't care if he's going further. We got to constrain him and keep him here. If that means hog tying him, we're going to hog tie him. He's got the words. He's got something about him. Remember, Peter said, you got the words of life. Where are we going to go? There is something about this man. I don't know what it is but there's something about him. And when he gave them the bread, it said that they knew him. They beheld him. They recognized him. They knew him fully for who he was. Jesus, in his glorified state, appeared to them, and they couldn't recognize him, maybe for their grief, maybe because he withheld his identity, or a combination of both. They're walking on the road to Emmaus, looking for something that would ease their pain from the moment and the disappointment and the grief that they just experienced. They're walking to nowhere. They're just two unknown disciples, and Jesus, in his glorified body, took Resurrection Sunday and spent it with these guys and he broke bread with them and he said here and they knew who he was because in the place of your brokenness there is a table where the Lord is wanting to invite you and commune with him and it's not so that you can get all the answers it's so that you can know him listen the answers didn't reveal him all the scriptures were good to have and they were good to know and they were expounded upon and that was really great. But at the moment, 
that they knew him. And the moment that they had the answer they were looking for, and the moment that energized them that I'll show you in a minute, it came from the table of communion with him. What does this have to do with being presence-driven? This is a presence-driven month. What does that even mean? It means that in the midst of his presence, there's a table. Listen, one thing I wanted to share with you, and I didn't want to spend that much time diving into it, but pastor's going to talk this week about the, the pathway to his presence. He's going to talk about the tabernacle. And I want you to know something, that there's all these elements of the tabernacle. There's the altar. There's the laver. There's the lampstand, there's the altar of incense, and there's the Holy of Holies. Well, the Holy of Holies representing the realm of God. Outside the camp, the realm of man. You know what's in between those two realms? There's a table. You go past the altar on both sides. You go past the laver and past the lampstand. There's a table. There's a table where the priests would have communion with the Lord. And in the midst of the brokenness of your situations, in the midst of what you're going through, seeking and looking and wondering and asking and pursuing and all these different things, there's a table. Jesus knew the end from the beginning. He knew where they would end up. He knew that these two unknown disciples, walking away from their friends, walking away from the company that they kept, walking away from their hope, walking away from their dreams, walking away from what they thought would happen, they knew, he knew that they would end up at this table. And that's where he wanted to be. And he did not reveal himself until that point. That's where I'm gonna reveal myself, at the table. Not on the road, not when I'm sharing all these scriptures. Scriptures are good, they're vital, and I'll show you that in a minute. But at the table, that's where they found him. That's where they knew him when they communed with him. Can you catch that for a second? Can you think about that for a second? in the midst of their brokenness, in the midst of their disappointment, in the midst of them seeking and reasoning and wondering and asking and pursuing all these things. Remember, two unknown disciples sat on the back row. We don't know who they are. We just don't know much about their life. They're going to Emmaus. We don't know where that is. We just know that it's a place of hot springs for healing. We know that they were wandering in multiple different directions. We know that there's this place that could be Emmaus. There's that place that could be Emmaus. There's this place going anywhere basically going nowhere, Jesus interrupts them on the road to nowhere, these two unknown men, and he says, foolish ones who were dull of heart and slow to believe. What does he say after their eyes were open? Well, what, what happens after their eyes are open? Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight, and they said to one another, this is probably one of my favorite verses in all of scripture, they said to one another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us. Did not our heart burn within us. Listen, a few passages before, a few verses before, these were the dull of heart. And as he walked with them and as he talked with them, something began to burn inside of them that compelled them to restrain him and constrain him and say, abide with us. And then in the moment of their communion with him, they knew him. They knew him. They had, that word means to have full knowledge of. To whatever capacity they could, they knew him in his glorified state. Resurrection Sunday, they saw him. All that time they sat with him. All that time preparing the meal, breaking the bread, sitting there with him, all that time walking on the road and he's talking and they're just quiet. Their heart was burning in the midst of their disappointment, in the midst of their grief, in the midst of their doubt, their heart was burning in proximity to Jesus. Think about that for a second. In the place of communion, they beheld him. They recognized him. That means to intently acknowledge, to be intimately and fully known. See, Jesus took them through the process, gave them all the answers, all the textbook answers. 
He expounded, he shared, he revealed. Their heart was burning, their heart was beating. They were alive, they were quickening, they were coming back to life. And then the final, in that place of communion, he reveals himself. Can I just give this to you for a second? I think that a lot of us have come to different places in different stages of that journey. We've walked through seasons of disappointment. We've walked through seasons of sacrifice. We've walked through seasons of doubt and reasoning and trying to figure stuff out. And then here's what happens. We start reading, we start studying, we start praying and getting alone with the Lord and then our hearts begin to burn and we go, there it is, we're back. We're back, I got my passion back, I got my zeal back, I got my, I'm good. It wasn't enough that their heart was burning. They had to see him. Catch that. It wasn't enough that their heart was burning. They had to see him. They had to see him. And in the place of our journey with the Lord, in moments like this, we get satisfied with our heart quickening. We get satisfied with our heart burning. Oh, I felt him in worship, but did you see him? I felt him when I read my Bible this morning, but did you commune with him? I felt him whenever I got encouraged by that testimony, but did you break bread with the bread of life? I felt him whenever, you know, I I shared that testimony with somebody at work. Yeah, but did it sustain you through seasons of disappointment? The bread of life gave them the broken bread. And he says, I am the bread of life. Anyone who, who partakes will never hunger. never hunger again. In that moment of communion, in that place, they saw him and they recognized him and they fully knew him. And I love what happens next. Remember, these guys ran away. Again, these weren't the two. Guys, chances are, no one even knew they were gone. These weren't those guys. Where's Cleopas and the other guy? I don't know. (laughs) They ran away. And I love, (laughs) okay, can I share this with you guys? I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna share it it here, and then I'll go back up there. (laughs) I love that it was two of them. Because when we find places and moments of disappointment in our life, we always kind of bring along somebody else with us, don't we? Can I say it like that? Hey, maybe I should get down a little bit. Hang on. <clears throat> when we go through seasons of disappointment, and we, I, <laughs> we, we're like Cleopas. We speak for multiple people. We were hoping he was the one. The other guy didn't get a word in edgewise. See, when we go through seasons of disappointment, we like other people to be disappointed with us. Oh, hang on. I I wasn't hanging. Let me make sure I'm down here. We like other people to be disappointed with us. Cleopas brought a friend on his road to nowhere. He brought a friend on his road to finding something that might ease the pain. We do that, don't we? We go through hard times. We go through hope deferred. We get our heart sick, and then we bring someone with us on that road. Here's two of them. Probably no one knows they're missing. They ran away on their road to nowhere. Jesus shows up. He begins to teach them. Their heart begins to burn and quicken again, but that's not enough. They go into the place, and they say, abide with us. And then they know him, and they see him, and they recognize him, and they are filled by the bread of life. Can you imagine that? Now I'm thinking, hey, that other guy, he got a pretty good deal. He started on the road <laughs> thinking he was going to go to a little pity party. They were going to go down the road and they were going to go find a hot spring, right? Just going to go somewhere that might ease the pain. Hot spring for healing. That's what the, road, the place of Maus means. But I love this. Did not our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and while he opened scriptures to us? And then verse 33, so they rose up that very hour. Listen, they had already said, hey, look, the day is done. We're tired. We've been through enough. Let's just call it. We're going to stay here for the night. 
don't, don't worry about traveling. It's already late. You stay with us, right? They've already done that. They've already resigned themselves to staying in for the night. They're seven miles from Jerusalem. That's not too, too far, but it's far enough, right? It's far enough. But that very hour they rose and returned to Jerusalem and found the 11 and those who were gathered together and they said, the Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And they told about all the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. They, they got the news about he'd appeared and they, they were quickened by their encounter with him and they ran back to Jerusalem. And let me just tell you this. When you have those places of communion, this is what I really want to break down for you real quick. Why am I talking about this when we're talking about being presence-driven? Because in the place of communion with him, in the place of his presence, in the midst of the brokenness, in the midst of the disappointment, in the midst of the shame, in the midst of all this kind of stuff, they had communion with him, and that drove them to return to the place of their disappointment. Listen. When you're going through it, find the table. When you're going through brokenness, when you're going through disappointment, when you're going through doubt, find the table. Find the table. Find where your heart begins to burn and then just go there and stay with him until you see him because at that point, when you see him, you can return to the place of your disappointment with a renewed hope. Listen, some of you, the Lord, why, why do you think that the Lord calls people who have been addicted to drugs to be deliverers of those who have been addicted to drugs? How, why, why do you think that he's, he's called people who have been victims of sex trafficking to be those who free others from sex trafficking? Because in the place of your disappointment, when you've had an encounter with Jesus, you can return to the place of your disappointment with a renewed hope. You can return to that place of your greatest defeat with a renewed victory. Because these two had boldness to return to the place that they had run away from. Listen, I don't know who needs to hear this, but this is what I wanted to get at. There are people here who you have run away from that dream. You've run away from that calling. You've run away from that relationship. You've run away from the Lord. Find the table. Find the table. Listen, it's not enough to have your heart burn when you get inside the church and you get, you got the scripture, you got the worship song and your heart begins to burn and you go, good, I'm, I'm good. It's not enough. I'm telling you, find the table. These men were not compelled on the road to then go run back to Jerusalem. Their heart was burning the whole time he talked. That did not compel them. What compelled them? Sight of him. Vision of him. Beholding him. Look, you gotta sit with him until you begin to see him. You gotta behold him until you get to know him. But it starts with being with him until you burn for him.